The world is mourning Archbishop Desmond Tutu. He stood for justice, forgiveness and inclusiveness in South Africa and beyond. How will his spiritual leadership be remembered? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Ahabara. Memorial services are being held all around South Africa for anti-apartheid hero Desmond Tutu. And all around the world, tributes are being paid to the Nobel Peace Prize laureate who died last Sunday, age 90. He's remembered for using his pulpit and public demonstrations to energize public opinion against racial inequality both at home and abroad. South Africa's president, Cyril Ramaphosa, called Tutu a patriot without equal and a leader of principle and pragmatism. Fellow South Africans are observing a week of national mourning before his funeral on New Year's Day. Famida Miller reports for us from St. George's Cathedral in Cape Town. Archbishop Desmond Tutu rose to prominence in the 1980s, not only as a religious figure, but also a very strong anti-apartheid activist. He spoke truth to power. That's what people today say in terms of the work that he did during the struggle against apartheid. But even after his retirement in 1996 uh, as Archbishop, at this cathedral, St. George's Cathedral in Cape Town, he continued to speak out against what he considered to be various injustices. He was also critical of the African National Congress, the governing party in South Africa, talking about issues around corruption, poverty, and still trying to deal with the racial uh, difficulties and challenges that South Africa continues to experience. Those who have come here to pay tribute to the late Archbishop say he was the voice of the voiceless. He said that as long as everybody wasn't free, that there was no freedom at all. De dealing with issues not just in South Africa, but globally, whether it was Tibet or Palestine, he continued to want to challenge what he considered to be oppression of people all around the world. We expect mourners to continue visiting the church. There are a number of memorial services being held throughout South Africa during the week. The Archbishop will lay in state for two days before being um, laid to rest or he will be cremated and uh, the funeral taking place on New Year's Day at this very cathedral. We'll bring in our panel shortly, but first let's take a moment to look at the life of the Archbishop. Desmond Tutu was born in a mining town outside Johannesburg during strict segregation of black and white South Africans. He was just 17 when National Party came to power in 1948 and racial inequality became law. That was the beginning of apartheid. He became a teacher, witnessing firsthand the government's policy of depriving black South Africans of education, consigning them to servitude. Later, he joined the Anglican clergy, rising to become Dean of Johannesburg and eventually Archbishop of Cape Town. That propelled him into the public spotlight as an unflinching moral voice. His fight for equality and justice was rewarded with the Nobel Peace Prize in 1984 a recognition that helped amplify the anti-apartheid movement worldwide. Ten years later, he introduced Nelson Mandela as South Africa's president, bringing the apartheid era to an end. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was one of the world's foremost human rights campaigners, raising the voices of not just South Africans, but also Palestinians, Iraqis and the Rohingya and many others. Let's bring in our guests all in Johannesburg. Professor Farid Ishaq is a friend of the Tutu family and veteran of South Africa's struggle for liberation. David Munai is a researcher and political commentator focusing on African affairs. Tembisa Fakudi is senior research fellow at the Africa-Asia Dialogues Organization and a board member of the Mail and Guardian newspaper. Welcome to the program. Farid, first, what was... Desmond Tutu's most important contribution to South African struggle for freedom. Um, <clears throat> Desmond Tutu's most uh, important contribution was the legitimacy, uh, the personal religious um, <clears throat> authority 
uh, position on the question of uh, the boycott of South Africa. Um, <clears throat> inside South Africa, we, it was a crime uh, sentenced to a minimum of five years to call for any kind of sanctions against South, against South Africa. Now, of course, the African National Congress and others had done this from abroad. But inside South Africa, Desmond Tutu's uh, enunciation or calling for that boycott, um, if one has to reduce uh, his uh, work to the most important, I would say it was to make those who called for a boycott whom he made them um, <clears throat> immune. He immunized many, many of us against uh, action by the apartheid regime, mm -hmm. simply because of his huge stature that he had. David, how do you think he will be remembered by the young South Africans, mostly those born after the end of the apartheid? I think, uh, first and foremost, he is going to be uh, seen as a moral compass for the country, uh, a man that used the pulpit uh, to deal with the complex political uh, issues, um, both domestic and internationally. And a man really that paved the way as a reconciliator, uh, bringing peace and stability uh, in South Africa and across the African continent. Mm -hmm. Tembesa, 1984, when he got the Nobel Peace Prize, was it a turning point for South Africans and international recognition for the fact that it's about time to restore rights for the South Africans? I think that played an important role in uh, highlighting the plight of the South Africans at the time. So yes, indeed, it was a, a very important moment uh, for South Africa uh, in 1984 when he received that Nobel Peace Prize. We know, of course, that after that, there's been uh, other uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureates uh, in South Africa, F.W. Clegg and Nelson Mandela. But Bishop Tutu remains one of those who received it during the height of apartheid. And um, he used it quite well because he went around the world publicizing the plight of South Africans and the evilness of apartheid. Farid, uh, everybody remembers the iconic picture of Desmond Tutu introducing Man Mandela as the first president of South Africa after the apartheid. Now, you have on one hand the charismatic leader of the ANC, along with Tutu, widely seen as the conscience of South Africans. Were they complementing each other? How would South Africa look like without them? Um, well, they were complementing each other. Um, and in a wonderful kind of fit, because while Mandela was the political statesperson, um, Mandela's own persona transcended that. Mm -hmm. And while Tutu was in many ways the spiritual father of the nation, including uh, Muslims and Hindus, by the way, um, <clears throat> um, and he, he spoke a political language also. So in some ways, they really complemented each other. Uh, South Africa, of course, will be much the poorer without them. Um, <clears throat> that's inevitably so. Uh -huh. Having said that, they also represented, I think, and we mustn't uh, ignore this, they represented strong structures. Of course, the African National Congress has considerably weakened over the years. Uh -huh. um, the church that Desmond headed has become much less prophetic and engaged with society over the years. But on the whole, um, with their inspiration and other organizational ideological formations inside the country, the country is quite strong constitutionally in terms of the freedom of the press, uh, personal freedoms, the Bill of Rights, and yeah. so on. And it is in that that the legacy of these people and the institutions that they uh, represented oh. um, will continue to live and hopefully okay. for a very long time ahead. <laughs> David, people remember him as a, uh, a virtuoso, uh, his sermons uh, all over the world. But many forget that he was quite instrumental in the, uh, raising the in international campaign to boycott the apartheid economically. Indeed. I think we can place him right um, as a voice uh, that uh, spoke from the pulpit. And uh, in the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s, where it became much more popular, 
Um, one wasn't expect um, uh, the, the church to play that pivotal role in struggle. I think we saw what was happening in Latin America, Chile, uh, the anti-Pinochet, and uh, uh, in Africa, he also led that where the church became in the forefront in the struggle against apartheid. Mm -hmm. And unlike most of our senior politicians, he is one person that never left the battlefield. He was right in front where people were facing uh, the brutal fascist apartheid uh, police and army. And uh, he stood between uh, uh, those forces and bringing stability and uh, taking the country into a much more uh, peaceful uh, and a country that is now known all over the world as uh, 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 promoting reconciliation mm -hmm. and, and peace and stability. Tembesa, talking about the Reconciliation, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, those South Africans traumatized, battered by the atrocities committed against them by the apartheid, who cannot forget what happened during the Soweto uprising, thought that for once this man was going to hold accountable those responsible for those atrocities. They were baffled, shocked when he said, it's about time to offer mercy to everyone. Yes, indeed, of course, he partnered in that project with Nelson Mandela and the entire leadership of the ANC. But uh, you know, when, when, when the news broke uh, of his uh, passing, one could not stop but remember when he broke down while listening to those um, testimonies of both the perpetrators and the victims of apartheid. So he truly believed in, in, in reconciliation uh, in South Africa. But importantly, he, he understood that apartheid was not only um, you know, it was not an oppression only for black people, but also white people also oppressed by apartheid because of the ignorance. And they often said that, that black and white were oppressed by apartheid. One, the others were oppressed by the system, of course, but white people as well were oppressed because of the ignorance. But there's another side of, of, of Bishop Tudor. I'm sure you're going to get to that question. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's, he was, a, he was a, a, a fun loving clergy. You know, he, he was a man of God who enjoyed a good laugh, often joking and, and, and making fun of others. One anecdote I'll tell quickly was when Nelson Mandela started wearing his, uh, his Indo-Malay shirts and Bishop Tutu questioned his sense of, of style, uh, criticizing Mandela's fashion sense. And Mandela retorted mm -hmm. by saying, it's funny coming from the men who wear dresses. So mm -hmm. this was Bishop Tutu who, who enjoyed a good laugh and uh, a good dance whenever there was a moment. Farid, the man of the church who was hoping to see a vibrant nation thrive after the end of the apartheid, had second thoughts about the experience or he was having uh, issues, particularly with Thabo Mbeki and Jacob Zuma. And he was categorically saying, what you're doing is dragging the nation into a disaster. He was warning the ANC that it's about time for them to reinvent themselves. Absolutely. But in many ways, he was only echoing what Mandela had said, even during his presidency, um, <clears throat> that if the ANC loses its part, if the ANC becomes uh, corrupt, and if this is, then uh, we need to take up uh, and, and resist uh, even what the ANC government is doing. So <clears throat> Desmond Tutu articulated his, his anger, um, firstly at the former president Thabo Mbeki's uh, seemingly indifference to uh, hundreds and thousands of people dying of HIV, um, and then uh, a generally corrupt tenure of uh, the immediate past president, uh, Jacob Zuma. And, but in doing so, of course, you know, uh, he irked some politicians uh, in the ruling party, but very many people, including those in the ruling party, they welcomed uh, his interventions. Um, and it wasn't just seen as a political kind of, uh, you know, scoring points that he may have said, if it say, came from the opposition party. Mm -hmm. It was Desmond Tutu, in many ways, the spiritual father of the nation. Um, and so people took him seriously. Of course, whether they took him seriously enough to stop their own corruption, that's a different story. 
Um, but given the fact that the country is, however slowly, on a turnaround, uh, one can see the immense appreciation that there is for Tutu, even at the fact that his funeral on the 1st of January is going to be a state funeral of the order that our country generally only affords to, uh, to living presidents who, uh, who pass away. Mm -hmm. So people have come to terms with Desmond Tutu. Of course, Desmond Tutu's challenge is don't come to terms with corruption. Mm -hmm. Don't come to terms with evil. That is a different story. David, so this, the, the, the establishment, the president, the ANC leaders came out praising the legacy of Desmond Tutu, the man who himself said, if your leaders give themselves for the sake of democracy and freedom, suddenly you're taking the wrong path, embezzlement of public funds, corruption to the point where many South Africans now are becoming more and more disillusioned. Do you think that this could be a moment when we're talking about the legacy of Desmond Tutu for the ANC in particular to think twice about how to Indeed. move forward? Indeed. I think the ANC is looking into uh, itself as it embarks on renewal process that is ongoing as we speak. And I think voices such as uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who is a constant reminder to the conscience of the party to live up to the wishes of the ordinary people, the ordinary uh, poverty-stricken um, communities, um, a voice for change in terms of the well-being of the people. And therefore, I think he was much more central that governance, justice, uh, reconciliation, politics has to save the people, uh, people-centered politics. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, I think that he took it beyond South Africa when he looked into uh, conflict uh, uh, stricken uh, neighboring countries, crisis in Zimbabwe, in Rwanda, South Sudan. And uh, you're speaking on issues uh, in Asia, uh, in the US itself. I think he criticized um, the head of states, United States, on Iraqi war. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think South Africa is going to miss that voice. But I think it also a renewal a younger generation that uh, walk on his path that is going to constantly remind us in terms of what we should be as a country and a continent. Fembisa, I think South Africans should be very proud of the man who's uh, call for restorative, not retributive justice, the need for national healing, were suddenly becoming uh, a lesson to the point where the UN is itself is sa said it's about time to replicate the Truth and Reconciliation Commission all over the world where we have problems. Yes, uh, I think you know, South Africa remains very proud of the contributions of Desmond Tutu. But importantly, he was an internationalist. As David said, you know, he embraced all the causes of oppressed people around the world. We know when he called as late as 2016, he called on the, the world to flock both um, Tony Blair and George Bush to the Hague for leading the entire world to the war in Iraq under the false uh, pretenses of, uh, of, of that country having the, the, the weapons of mass destruction. He was very vocal on Palestine, for example, uh, continually condemning the treatment of the Israelis uh, against the Palestinians. Uh, his, his position on, on Tibet with uh, his closest friend, uh, uh, Dalai Lama, he, he got into some... Um, trouble in South Africa uh, when the government of Jacob Zuma refused mm -hmm. the visit of Dalai Lama in this country. So he was an internationalist. Uh, he was a racialist uh, and a non-racialist for that matter. He didn't see color. And I think that's why he celebrated world over mm -hmm. uh, because of his stance on non-racial politics. Farid, how do you explain that someone like Desmond Tutu, a man of the church who navigates a long political career that spans decades with all the difficult, different religious, ethnic, racial minefields, still there is a global unanimity about himself. Everybody celebrates Desmond Tutu. Uh, <clears throat> well, I don't know. I mean, the one is, you know, that it's kind of very difficult to be out of step with the world. But I do think that there are elements who are celebrating his death. And I'm not talking about 
celebrating his life in the way that the service this morning uh, at St. George's Cathedral did. Uh, there are elements that would be more than happy to see the back of him, and that includes, for example, uh, many right-wing uh, Zionists throughout the world. I think that there are many right-wing Christians, um, certainly in uh, the southern parts of the United States, uh, who are happy. So I, I don't think, I think that the public image is of universal acclaim, um, but I noted, for example, the very muted a uh, response that came from uh, the uh, one of the South African uh, Jewish South African Jewish Federation. Mm -hmm. The Tutus, of course, made it clear that he's not anti-Semitic. But the point that I made, his explicit support for issues like, say, euthanasia, his explicit support, I mean, Tutu said, I will not enter paradise if I find that there is a homophobic God. Oops, so all of these things is uh, his insistence that life under Zionism for the Palestinians is far worse than what life under apartheid was for South Africans. Now, those people, um, they may be kind mm -hmm. of nodding in public and wearing a bit of a black scarf or something, but, you know, you're not going to tell me that they're mourning. So there's an image of universal sadness at Tutu's departure, in part because that those, those elements they can't afford to stand out as starkly okay. against universal values um, as they would want to. Uh, David, are we likely to see another Desmond Tutu in South Africa? Indeed, there are so many out there, and uh, I think we see with the young generation are uh, born in the post nineteen ninety four, uh, our own kids that are coming up. Um, schooled in um, norms, ethos, the values of Desmond Tutu, uh, that in itself uh, can be traced back uh, to early phase of the formation of ANC and become a South African political life where there, there's a constant mm -hmm. renewal. And therefore, I think he will be forever remembered as a reconciliator. Tembisa, you spoke about the other side of uh, Tutu, uh, uh, the true light of his life, frail, battling disease, the spark was still there, he was cracking jokes, he was talking about tomorrow as a better day. Is that same sentiment among the South Africans that tomorrow could be a better day and that the rainbow no nation will always be held together? Yes, um, I, I think so. The struggle continues in South Africa. Of course, Tutu faced his own generational agency. But uh, we, force a we face a different uh, social political agency in South Africa, that of ensuring, for example, that there are job opportunities, the economy, the economy improves in South Africa. So there is a level of, 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 of great optimism in this country, uh, notwithstanding the current challenges that we were facing. But given the, um, the challenges, global challenges brought by not only by the COVID-19 uh, and other global uh, economic uh, pressures, South Africa continues to grow. Uh, the, the, the democracy continues to mature. Uh, and I think what people like Desmond Tutu did was to introduce very strong political shock absorbers, notwithstanding that we now and then are challenged by certain social political uh, uh, pressures in this country, the country somehow uh, comes out a winner in most instances. So, and those are the, 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 the fundamentals that uh, the Arch uh, implemented in this country. Mm -hmm. And he will be remembered for all of those, uh, for all of those good things Quite uh, interesting. that he, he implemented before he died. Quite interesting as we reflect on the life and death of Desmond Tutu. For many, many people all over the world, the moment you start thinking about South Africa, it's Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela. Well, gentlemen, Farid Isaac, David Monai, and Thimbisa Fakudi, I really appreciate your insight. Thank you very much. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Hashem Akbar, and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now.